Welcome, I am Cyril Stober. The National Health Insurance Scheme, NHIS, was established under Act 35 of the 1999 Nigerian Constitution. It's to provide social health insurance from a common pool of funds contributed by participants. A prepayment plan where a participant contributes a fixed regular amount into a pool which allows health and maintenance organizations to pay for those needing medical attention. Now that's perhaps a simple way of explaining the scheme. What is not simple, however, is that the scheme has been bedeviled by all manners of operational crises. The NHIS is in focus as I sit with its executive secretary. Mohammed Nasser Sambu is a professor of health policy management, a fellow of the West African College of Physicians, a former provost of the College of Medicine, Kaduna State University, an alumnus of the World Bank Institute, visiting scholar, University of Aberdeen, Scotland, examiner, West African College of Physicians in Public Health. He was at some point Deputy Dean, Faculty of Medicine and Head, Department of Community Medicine, Ahmed Bello University, Zaria. He was a pioneer staff of the NHIS, but left in 2004 to pursue an academic career. Now, in July 2019, he was appointed Executive Secretary of the National Health Insurance Scheme. Professor Mohammed Nasser Sambu, thanks for joining us on One on One. Thank you. Good afternoon, Cyril. Right. You. Well, you were a pioneer staff of the NHIS. So, it would be right to say it's more like a homecoming for you when you were appointed, uh, you were going back home, right? That's right. Well, which also means that you ordinarily would be familiar with all the scheme from its takeoff and the numerous challenges it had to face. So would it be a fair comment to say that the NHIS since inception has been going through one problem or the other and has hardly lived up to its billing? Yeah, thank you very much, Cyril, for this uh, question. I think it is it is right to say that because uh, each organization has its mandate, mm -hmm. and uh, organization can be assessed by its ability to fulfill its mandate. Where it was, uh, where it is discovered that it is short of getting to its mandate, then we have to probe to find out what is happening. Certainly, things are not going well. Mm -hmm. uh, this is an organization that was established uh, in 1999 uh, to, among other things, ensure easy access to healthcare delivery services to Nigerians. Even though there is a caveat, the law establishing the National Health Insurance Scheme uh, has limited its operations to uh, only people that are within the, within the formal sector, either in the public sector or in private sector. Uh, the law was not actually all-encompassing to say that it will cover the entire Nigerians. Mm. But even when you look at the, 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 the prospective people that the law should have covered, the entire people in the public sector and the private sector who will say that NHIS has not been able to attend its mandate, mm. then when we probe, we now ascertain what are the factors that are responsible for that. All right, you, you got back to the NHIS in 2019. So let's take it from there and uh, move forward. You talk about rebranding. What exactly would this entail now? Since you, well, you, you would have studied what uh, the issues were. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, even though I left NHIS as a, as, a, as a staff, I returned back to the university. And one of the areas I am 
uh, I, I was teaching in the university was healthcare policy and healthcare financing. And every year you see people coming from different sectors, including health insurance, who have come for master's degree. So I, from the academic perspective, I am abreast of what has been going on in the national health insurance scheme. As of 19, as at, uh, in the last few years, everybody in Nigeria has, is, uh, is aware of the level of crisis that the organization has undergone. Uh, we have seen a, an organization whereby there is a lot of crisis. Uh, it is shown in, in, in media. Uh, people are coming to close gates, d barring other people from entering. Security men were, were coming to intervene. Tear gas was being thrown. And uh, everything was, a, was, was like in a cha chaotic situation. Until when, the, uh, he, when His Excellency, uh, the President, uh, President Muhammad Buhari, has ordered the uh, establishment of uh, independent fact-finding committee uh, panel to look at what are the, to, 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 deep, to dig, deep dive into what are the problems in the National Health Insurance Scheme. And uh, that, that uh, panel recommended that uh, the board should be dissolved and the former executive secretary to be uh, terminated. And that was what brought me to the organization. I was appointed in the f in 1st uh, July 2019, and I assume office in, uh, 50 on the 15th uh, of that month. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came, ordinarily I, uh, I need to uh, uh, come with an agenda that will uh, bring, bring about peace and stability. So I came with a rebranding agenda which is anchored on three points. Number one, to uh, restoring value system that will transform NHIS into a credible result-oriented organization. Number two, uh, uh, engendering transparency and accountability in the entire operations of the National Health Insurance. And number three, uh, attainment of rapid, uh, accelerating the attainment of the universal health coverage for all Nigerians. This third objective or this third rebranding agenda is in line with the President, uh, Pro President Muhammad Buhari next level agenda and in, it is in line with the sustainable development goals that every country is, is most strive to achieve by 2030. So I came with that agenda. I mobilized all the staff in the National Health Insurance Scheme to look at NHIS under my stewardship as a new NHIS. So we like drew a line from 15th uh, July 20, uh, uh, 2019 and say that what has happened in the past is an old NHIS. And what is going to happen from the, t from the 15th of July is going to be the new NHIS. So to ensure that we actualize this, and it's not mere slogan, we took the uh, entire staff into a retreat. When I say entire staff, I, d I do not mean that everybody has come into that retreat. We issue out, we, or we employ two uh, organizational consultants who have developed a, a format of uh, getting information from the staff as to their own perspective as uh, what are the problems of the scheme and what are the prospective solutions. So we take, took the management staff and we went into a three-day retreat where all those uh, responses from the, from the staff were analyzed. Uh, we use a, a, a software called a monkey survey where we now identify the 10 domains that are very valid in trying to reorganize the health sector. Uh, part of these 10 domains, we look at the ethics, work ethics within the organization. We look at the, the level of unity and, and, and common direction in, of the people. We look at issues that has to do with synergy and, and, and synergy. We look at issues that has to do with teamwork and team spirit. We look at the work environment. We also look at issues that has to do with effective communication within the organization. And we look at issues that has to do with reward and sanctions. And we also look at how records are being kept in the organization. And we look at issues that has to do with equity and fairness in the ma in management of the organization. So these are the 10 value systems that we have identified during that workshop, that retreat. And we came back to the organization 
and begin to deepen the implementation of, of, of this value system through training, through mobilization, and so on and so forth. Okay. And uh, we can say that within the last, uh, by, the t by the time we commence the implementation of those value system, you will now have a, a, a fairly stable organization. All right. So, One so of the biggest challenges of the NHIS has been determining the number of health insurance coverage. Now, can you clarify that for us here? Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I quite agree with you. NHIS has no denominator. And when I came as one of the element of transparency and accountability is the, uh, was that what is the denominator? Who is NHS covering? Is it the formal sector and private sector? And what is their total population? Because if you don't have that denominator, you won't be able to, uh, even if you say X is the numerator, you cannot have the proportion. And in science, we want to say what is the percentage of coverage. So when I came, one of the key issues is how do we work with evidence? And uh, I instructed the ICT, which I discovered that it was rudimentary. It was not even, it was collecting data and they were not able to analyze the data. So I put mechanism of analyzing a retrieval of that data. data. And uh, we now have uh, people, uh, the, the, the figure that was popularly, popularly quoted in the past was uh, NHIS cover only four, mil four to five million population. But unknown to people, the operations of the National Health Insurance Scheme is a decentralized operation. By decentralization, I mean you have, in addition to the National Health Insurance Scheme, which is covering the, 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 the people at the federal level, you have a state health insurance agencies. You also have people that are being captured privately by health maintenance organization. So unless you are able to aggregate that number, you won't be able to say these are the number of people that are covered in the national health insurance ecosystem. So we are now changing the narrative. We have developed, which uh, maybe we will come later, we have developed a national health, uh, health insurance under our roof system, whereby we are now aggregating the number of people that are captured manually. And so far, we have 12 million lives in the national health insurance scheme. And by the time we one of the objects of our transformation in the National Health Insurance Scheme is to have uh, to, to, to change the operation from manual based of operation to uh, automated based automa automation. And by the time we are able to deploy the, the, the overarching solution of the, of the ICT we are, we are developing, we will now be able to, to tell you every day what are the total number of the people in the ecosystem? All right, so now we can work with a figure of 12 million. Yes. But then from the 12 million, we ask how many of these who have needed medical attention have been able to access it? One of the greatest problems and uh, that led to part of the crisis in the NHIS was the question of HMOs. We are enrollees who have been turned away from hospitals because HMOs had not paid, had not fulfilled the obligation. Or sometimes people are told to get in touch with the HMO before they access treatment. Mm. How has that been resolved? Okay. Thank you very much. I think this is one area that we have worked assiduously because when we came, there were a lot of uh, dissentment. People were not satisfied with the health insurance uh, system. People were not satisfied with the uh, sh health insurance activities. You go to healthcare facility as an enrollee, you are turned back. And what is the reason NHS has no, uh, health maintenance organization has not paid? So when I came, I reviewed the, situa I reviewed the system. I now discover a system whereby every month NHS will uh, will reimburse national uh, health uh, HMOs, and HMO will in turn reimburse the healthcare facilities for the capitation and fee for service. Capitation is 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 a block payment that is done at for primary healthcare services, whereas fee for service is a payment that is made on referral. So I realized that 
the fault was not even holy by HMO because there should be a timeline upon which you give HMO money and the HMO in turn give the healthcare facility. And there is a concept of when to court register in the National Health Insurance Scheme. And when you court the register, you now know the number of lives each HMO has, and you now know the amount of money that you need to, to, to deploy to the HMOs. I realized that in the process of quoting that register, there is a delay from NHIS. And, and that money is supposed to have gone, like reputation, supposed to have gone in advance. So that delay, there is a delay on the part of NHIS. There is a delay also in, on the part of HMO to reimburse the healthcare facilities. Then I, I, I brought all the stakeholders and I said, ah, uh, why can't we change the mode of, modus of, of payment so that we can pay the, the HMO quarterly? We can pay HMO quarterly in advance and the HMO will now pay healthcare facility also in advance and we employ that strategy by 1st January this year and that has been a game changer in the delay in the payment of services. Do you worry about advance payment? I mean can you vouch specifically for all the HMOs that when they collect money they will remit to the care providers when necessary. Part of the allegations of old was that HMOs would collect money and then deploy such funds to something else and delay the payment while they reap benefits from those funds having been deployed somewhere else. And that led to hospitals turning people back. Can you now vouch for all the HMOs? Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think NHIS is a, is a regulatory agency and uh, there must be uh, a rule of the game. And uh, they all know uh, we had a st strategic stakeholders engagement with the HMOs and the providers and the enrollees. And uh, we clearly identified that as a major problem because if you continue to do a one month uh, payment, you will always have a delay. So it is, you need to marry between uh, trying to make, uh, to, to ensure efficiency in your service or try to, uh, or, or leave it, people will continue to complain and that uh, the whole NHIS is, be, is smeared as a bad organization. So what, before we ensure uh, return of the quarterly payment, we had to put mechanism of reconciliation on ground. In every state, we have an office. And uh, in each geopolitical zone, we have a zonal office. So what we do, uh, we move the payment and we ensure that they pay. And uh, we now reactivate our, our sanction. In fact, we, we, we now have a situation whereby you hardly see a primary health care uh, a, a provider complaining of the payment of, 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 of capitation. This is the first one that you pay. However, when it comes to the issue of, uh, of fee for service, uh, uh, HMO gives or issue out authorization code to, uh, to, 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 an, to an enrollee who is requiring referral services. And uh, there is a delay in, in trying to reconcile that authorization code. So the next level of, uh, of action that we need to do as a, as a credible organization is to create a platform whereby we ensure that that reconciliation is undertaken. We, we have made provision in this year's budget to ensure that every state office has a professional in, in, in form of doctor uh, or, or uh, um, pharmacist who will vet any, authoriz any authorization code given by HMO. And because HMO do delay in the process of giving authorization code, we want to ensure that by the time we have this healthcare for professional that can quickly verify the, any need for referral, we will issue authorization code where we discover NH, a HMO is delaying and we will now deduct whatever is going to be deducted for the payment of healthcare provider. So what I'm saying in a nutshell, we, we could not have been able to, to, to return to the quarterly payment without putting in place adequate check to ensure that no HMO flow this arrangement. Okay, uh, Professor Samba, I hope you do appreciate why we are 
concentrating on the HMOs, the services provided by the healthcare uh, providers, I mean the end release, because these seem to be the major crux of the matter. Yes. From the basic, the people say, what is covered under the scheme? They also have challenges going to hospitals where and release are told this is not under the NHS. And then, and then of course, there were also complaints about um, hospitals moving youth corps members and, uh, you know, inexperienced health professionals to see people under the NHS. Uh, under the NHIS, for instance, and then really goes to the hospital, and the first question is, is this under NHIS? And if it is, they deploy you to, you know, something that is not up to standard. Mm. Regulatory framework used to be one of the complaints against the NHIS. How have you addressed that? Excellent. Uh, Cyril, we are in 21st century now, and uh, most of uh, advanced countries have automated their processes. And uh, we cannot continue to operate a manual NHIS and be able to achieve the desired results in terms of having a regulatory function. That is why if you look at the, the three-point agenda, the major key issue in, in, in engendering transparency and accountability is having uh, its ability to have a robust ICT so that you can be able to, to monitor the entire operations uh, with automation of the of, of ICT and uh, with uh, the with the current effort that we are doing with the with the Ministry of Telecommunication on e-governance and NIMSI, we want to ensure that there is an interoperability in terms of people having a uh, NIM card as well as identification when they come to NHIS ecosystem. That is why. One of the major issues that we are doing in NHIS is how do we ensure complete automation of business processes of the National Health Insurance Scheme. And we have gone very, very far with, for, with that. Uh, the Minister of Telecommunication is, is greatly assisting us in that. The uh, our Minister of Health is also greatly assisting us with that. Just two days ago, we, 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 we had an online presentation with the, to the, with the Minister of, uh, of Telecommunication where we presented the total package of the automation. And we have already gotten an approval, uh, a, 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 a clearance from NIGDA, which is the ogre responsible for ensuring that comprehensive ICT is come into play. Mm -hmm. So by the time we deploy our ICT, we will be able to monitor every bit of activity that we are doing. For example, uh, people that are coming to register will be able to eliminate the, 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 the people that are not within the ecosystem. And secondly, we will be able to ensure that all payment and all transaction that has taken place will automatically seen in the dashboard of, 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 the, of, the, of the executive secretary or any other person within that ecosystem. So the, 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 the bullet magic, the, the magic bullet yeah. is the issue of automation. And uh, when we have that automation and we strengthen our, zone, our, 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 our state offices, we will be able to achieve that needed uh, regulation that we are envisaging. So it brings us to the, this issue of what is covered and what isn't covered. Yeah, excellent. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, Cyril, you will, uh, there is dearth of information within the National Health Insurance Scheme. Uh, when, when there is a program that is currently being uh, implemented, if you ask Nigerians, the majority they don't know, the Voluntary Social Health Insurance Program. So one of the critical success factor in the operations of National Health Insurance Scheme or Health Insurance Anywhere is ability to deploy information to all the enrollees. And uh, what, we are, have, what we are doing to be able to get that information across is we have just concluded development of a small handbook which outlines everything that every enrollee is entitled to. And we will, be, we will ensure that every enrollee has that handbook. If a drug is prescribed to him and 
it is said that that drug is not part of the, of the benefit package. He will open that handbook and spot that drug and he will demand his right. So these are some of the tools that are very necessary in ensuring that rights of uh, a rollist are protected as well as rights of all other people in the, stake, uh, at the ecosystem. So this handbook, an enrollee has it, they go to hospital, whatever they're told, they can cross-check. Cross-check. Or perhaps they're told, well, your illness doesn't fall under coverage. You check. They check there. Yes, yeah, they check How there. soon can you deploy this? In fact, we have finished the, we have developed a zero draft. We subjected it to scrutiny and we have, everybody has given its own input. Now we are going into the press. And by the time we finish the process with the, with the BPP, I think in the next two months, that book should be available. So the enrollee would also have a method, a, a way to uh, seek redress from the regulator if any of those um, uh, conditions are breached in the handbook. Yeah, the, the last chapter in that handbook is mechanism of complaint. It has outlined where and when a, a particular enrollee will seek redress. And it is going to be a multi -layer at multi-layer level. At the, at the level of state, we have assigned some role so that they can quickly cross-check and, and, and ensure the right of, of enrollee is, is protected. Where it is beyond them, it will go to the higher level. In the NHS, we have a legal department with the paraplenia of all the uh, of professionals who are there to take. So the handbook has outlined clearly how a mechanism of seeking redress in the event of any infraction. Okay, as you said about repositioning the NHIS, there was the issue of the HMOs. I go back to the HMOs again. Uh, and how there could have been ghost HMOs in the system. How it would have been suggested that the best way is to re-accredit those HMOs. Do you have any such plans? We have just finished undertaking a accreditation exercise. Okay. In fact, when I came, accreditation exercise was done uh, about three, four years ago, but the result was not out. It was just dumped. But I now review because the time for re-accreditation has also come. But the other one that was conducted was not implemented. So we, we believe that uh, when I had a, uh, held a management meeting, it was suggested that let us complete that process so that we won't be uh, abandoning what, what has been started. So we now brought it, we clean it up, we send it to the Honorable Minister who approved and we convey the result. And uh, in that approval, some HMO were delisted right. because they have not fulfilled the criteria. Some were given provisional um, uh, uh, accreditation. That is to say that they have to remedy the, the, the problems they have for them to be given uh, a final accreditation. And the, t and the window period is within three months. Uh, they were supposed to have, uh, the three months would have supposed to have elapsed, uh, I think, in, in April. But because of COVID, we extended it for two months so that they can, they can, they can be able to remedy, remedy the, 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 the problems. Now, this all ties up with uh, the renewal of licenses. Absolutely. Right. Now, now that's for the HMOs. What about the hospitals? Have the, you taken a look at them as well? Every, every two years hospitals are re-accredited right. because uh, a facility can, 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 can bring about a pseudo or false uh, sense of well-being during accreditation. That's why we undertake that frequently. And uh, what we are trying to, to, to inject into the system to ensure uh, credibility of the system is we saw it in Ghana, whereby it is not only the people in the agency that will, that will go for accreditation. You have some healthcare professionals who are also in the team. They are independent people, but we are discussing that maybe it will be able to enhance our uh, uh, the result of our accreditation. Because you cannot rule out 
uh, some some level of uh, connivance when right. it comes to accreditation. So we don't want to take any leave anything to chance. We are, we, we are trying to see where infraction or where connivance is done in giving accreditation of a person who has who is not deserved. So we want to incorporate a, a private uh, people to be in the team. Maybe that can, will, will enhance okay, So now we're looking at the accreditation, which will take place, you say, every two years. Every two years. The last exercise, um, we think, was done perhaps two Tw or three years ago. No, the accreditation of healthcare facility mm -hmm. took place in, 19, in 2019. 2019. So we are looking for 2021 okay, to, 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 to embark on the mass accreditation. However, right. if we have new, uh, if we have new applications, and we have sufficient number to warrant undertaking uh, mop up accreditation. Sure. We do mop up accreditation because we want to ensure that we have more healthcare facility within the national health uh, insurance ecosystem to give a release a uh, chance to be to, to 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 select which one they will work with. Yeah. All right. Uh, th there's so many issues tied with the uh, release, the hospitals, and the HMOs, and of course. Who is captured on the scheme? So far, we've talked uh, mainly on those within uh, uh, government uh, structure, the government institutions, those who are public servants, you know. But there's also the bit of private sector, which you started talking about, and uh, some are captured on how far with the private sector participation in the scheme. Um, uh, thank you very much. The, uh, the, despite the fact that the scheme law has provided only for formal sector, which we are doing with the government employees and the private sector. I think many private sector are coming. Many. And uh, these are the data that we are aggregating now. And uh, if you give us some few weeks, we'll be able to tell you that these are the number of people within the private lives. Private sector, some come through the National Health Insurance Scheme. Therefore, we have their data. Some go directly through the, the HMOs. We, we are supposed to have their data. In fact, we are awaiting their data any moment from now. We, are, we have sent to HMO to supply us with the data. Some have started responding. But we want to have a comprehensive lives that have been captured by the private sector. In addition to that, we are, you remember what is basic health care provision fund. Uh, there is an attempt by the government now to see that the vulnerable segment of the population are also covered through the provision of 1% consolidated revenue that is going into the national health, uh, national health system, mm -hmm. out of which half of it is, supposed, is going to the National Health Insurance Scheme, uh, which is deployed to states health insurance to capture the vulnerable segment of the population. Most of the state uh, have just established the state health insurance. Mm -hmm. And they are, now, they are now capturing the people that are vulnerable in, the, in those populations. And by the time we aggregate, it is an extension of purchasing function of the National Health Insurance Scheme since the money is coming from the central government. So by the time we do that aggregation, you will now discover that we have transcended beyond only the people in the formal sector. We are also dealing with the vulnerable segment population as defined in the, in the operational manual of the Basic Health Care Prohibition Fund. Speaking about vulnerable uh, section, a part of that vulnerable section, if you would agree with me, has to do with senior citizens, retirees who are no longer in service, you know, government employment. What's it in for them? Because as soon as they retire, that's it for the early child. And these, most of the times, are the people who really need social insurance. Yeah, uh, when I came, the, there is no program for retirees per se. And uh, now we have the mandate to ensure compulsory, uh, we, we, are we are trying to review our law of the national health insurance. In fact, this is one of the directives of, the Mr. of Mr. President, to have a mandatory social health insurance scheme, whereby everybody will cover within the, the, the ecosystem. And uh, we develop a matrix of all Nigerians under the health ins concept of health insurance under our roof. And one of the segments of the population that ought to be covered are the retirees. We have defense 
all their retirees are captured. Mm. And uh, we have gone to advance discussion with the police to get all the, in fact, uh, by, la by this month, the money for covering retirees of the police has come to the National Health Insurance right. Scheme. Uh, the DSS, we have gone into uh, collaboration. All the DS, uh, retirees within the DSS have been captured, all within this period. Okay. So we are also talking with the retired permanent secretaries who do have who exit with their with their with their with their salaries so that they can continue to to to, to be what, under the national health insurance scheme. Yes, the main core civil service. You talk about the permanent secretaries. They're way up there. We're talking about those who are at the bottom of the ladder. They exit the service. There's nothing for them. Um, the the coverage is gradual. We have up to 2030 based on the SDG goal to cover the entire Nigerian. So we we are we are starting with the soft foot. If you if you have to cover the entire retiree, there must be budgetary provision for them. Okay. Uh, and many people would say, why not start with those who are more vulnerable? Permanent secretaries are well catered for. No, for the permanent secretaries, we are not asking government to bring any resources, any additional mm -hmm. resources. Mm -hmm. But because they go out with their salaries, we want them to, re to be retained in the national health insurance and uh, deduction should be made okay. out of that money. So by the time, y you see, the, the, the health insurance survive on funding. All right. If you have people that can automatically bring fund to your, to your health insurance okay. ecosystem, you bring them, you bring them okay. so that you have large liquidity to begin to cover right. those who are not covered okay just l like the like the real civil servants now those on grade level one two three four five who go out and their pensions are i mean you can't even afford to take anything out for health care out of those so there has to be something for those people. absolutely but for you to even make uh this is where we are talking about innovative financing mm. Uh, you have to know how many of them. Mm. You have to know how much is required to be able to cover them. And you cannot do that without innovative financing. Mm. And that is one of the key aspects, one of the pillars of, the of health insurance under our roof. What are the various innovative ways we can generate fund to ensure that we have more fund into the system that will cover the vulnerable? Because those retirees fall under the aged and, and the vulnerable, vulnerable. groups. Right. Uh, if you have, if you had listened to the presentation by the graduates of the of, of, of national uh, of NIFS mm -hmm. last year, they made presentation to, to to Mr. President on how they can use innovative financing within the telecommunication industry to generate revenue to ensure universal health coverage. Because the universal attainment of universal health coverage is a concern of every government. It's a declaration, it's a global declaration that has been signed. Therefore, all hands must be on deck to ensure that wherever there is resources to, to, to achieve uh, the mandate of universal health coverage, it is, it is done. So by the projection of the uh, graduate of the NIFS, which they presented to, to, to President, if one couple will be deducted from any phone call. Billions and billions of Naira can be generated seamlessly. And with that seamless contribution, you call, you make a call of, 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 of 100, 200 Naira, one cover is removed. You will not feel it. Nobody will feel it. That can generate a lot of resources. So we are, we are not saying that that has been approved. But these are some of the ideas that we are generating within the system so as to refine them and see which one will be workable. By the time we do that and we get more funding into the, into, into the health system, then you can, we already have a strata that we call matrix of coverage. We know where the resources can be deployed to cover the vulnerables. Okay, let's look at the issue of youth core members uh, in the scheme. Yes. Uh, members of the National Youth Service Corps are recommended. Yeah. The National Youth Corps is within the matrix of coverage because we believe that they are vulnerables. Vulnerable in the sense that they move from one area to, to another. 
and they have a lot of healthcare challenges. And uh, if we can get to cover 360,000 of them on average yearly, we will be able to push the number of enrollees we have. To that effect, we paid a courtesy call to the, there was an approval, mm -hmm. there was an presidential approval to the National Health Insurance Scheme to cover this vulnerable, but it was never, it was never completed. So what we did is to pay a courtesy call to the Director General of NYSC, and we set up a technical committee. We brought all those those approvals that have that have taken place, and we have we package the the, the the letter and we sent to our Honorable Minister, which in turn sent to the Minister of Finance because it has a cost implication. So the, 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 the letter is now in the Ministry of Finance receiving attention. So by the time we have uh, a response from that, we will automatically cover all the youth cult members in, 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 in Nigeria. All right, um, let, let's come back to the NHIS itself and its structure. Um, and uh, its funding and its resources. It's been suggested that huge funds belonging to the NHIS are trapped in commercial banks. How have you gone about recovering them and uh, what is the next step? Yeah, uh, it is true during transition uh, to TSA, NHIS has lost a lot of its funds. And uh, when I came as an executive secretary, I took the inventory of all the monies that has been lost by the National Health Insurance Scheme. For example, we have some money that was said to have been uh, pushed from guaranteed trust to the consolidated revenue instead of going into the TSA account of the National Health Insurance Scheme. So all those monies that have been lost, we have mapped them out and we had held meeting with the Accountant General we have held meeting with the Minister of Finance and uh, is receiving a lot of attention. So uh, by the time we, we uh, uh, I know that the, the, the letter, some of the letters have come back from the office of the Minister to the Accountant General, so we are awaiting response. And there is a very good prospect that such money will be recovered from National Health Insurance Scheme. In fact, more importantly to the National Health Insurance Scheme is ability and capacity to invest its money. The law establishing the National Health Insurance Scheme has provided that monies from the NHIS should be in invested. And uh, 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 at the time of transition to uh, or migration to, 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 to uh, TSA, that possibility of, uh, of investment was lost. But we have written a letter, we have make, mm -hmm. made a strong case, and uh, I think that one will come very soon. So you're optimistic this amount of money uh, running into billions, perhaps, can really get back to the NHIS they are, and be reinvested? They are genuine money for the National Health Insurance Scheme. Okay. And uh, uh, we are optimistic that th those money, because it belongs to the organization, it will come, whether now or in future. But we have set up a mechanism to ensure that we follow those monies judiciously. All right. Let's talk about something that's of the moment and which is a huge, huge, huge challenge, not just to Nigeria, but the entire world. And that is COVID-19. How involved is the NHIS in this matter of COVID-19? What is the response of NHIS? What's happening? Um, uh, NHIS uh, is, is sad this uh, pandemic has come at the time when globally there, 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 there is a widespread financial uh, problems. And uh, if you look at NHIS, it's, uh, the core mandate of NHIS is how do you make finances available to individuals to access quality health care. So when the COVID came, we look at our mandate and we try to do things based on our mandate. NHS has the mandate to inform, edu educate, and communicate to people. So we put it as part of our own responsibility to ensure that we inform, we educate, we communicate to our staff, 
and to our enrollees. And we have developed ICT in that respect because information is power. Secondly, with the COVID, there is a possibility. Uh, we envisage that there was a possibility of lockdown. Mm. And uh, if there is a lockdown in, uh, in the month of February, uh, around the month of February, we envisage that there will be a lockdown. And if there is a lockdown, and th this lockdown is affecting our banks, and therefore we cannot easily maintain services of the enrollees in the healthcare facilities, W uh, without payment. So we now quickly organize to ensure that we paid HMO and we instructed he uh, health maintenance organization to be ready to pay healthcare providers their fund so that there will be no disruption of normal service delivery in the healthcare facility. And I think I receive a lot of calls from, the, from, from many CMDs that they were telling us that if not for the fund of the National Health Insurance Scheme, most of them will not have been able to run during COVID. So we maintain, we try to, 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 to make fund available for the healthcare facilities to continue to render services. Secondly, we look at the issue of healthcare workers protection because we are working with a lot of private sector organization. We are also working with a lot of public sector healthcare facilities. If a report has come whereby some private hospitals, some public hospitals are running away from their duty post because they cannot be protected. And uh, there was also a request to the PTF that uh, civil defense was, uh, is part of the frontline uh, non-health workers who were in all isolation centers. Just like media workers as well. <laughs> well, I, I, I think you yeah, need to... Yeah, non-health workers, but they're also in the front line. They are, they are also in the front line. <laughs> but, and but, exposed. But, yes, and exposed. So they requested for PPEs to PTF, and PTF approach us whether we can oblige. Then we, 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 we follow financial uh, process and we acquire those PPP, face mask, uh, overall, even though uh, pressmen are not involved in evacuation, so you might not have to get the overall, but you need They're to get involved the PPP. In coverage. It, 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 they talk to people. No, I mean the nurse, the face mask, yeah. and uh, maybe sanitizer mm -hmm. will do for the for the for for the media. But for those who are evacuated, coming mm -hmm. into con direct contact, right. they need to have that overall PPE for them to do that. So we were able to 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 uh, supply the uh, police. We took police because police has the highest number of enrollees within the national health insurance ecosystem. And they do have healthcare facilities. And if we have problem with the enrollees in police because of the number, there will be a problem. So we now gave police some of the item. We gave the civil defense some of the item. And we have also procured to give uh, facilities where there is a high density of the enrollees of the National Health Insurance Scheme, some of these PPEs. Well, no one could have envisaged that a pandemic would uh, ravage the world at the time it did. So some of the institutions um, that are in place to enhance the health of the citizens would be stretched and may be required to, as they say normally, think out of the box. Yes, of course, you're able to make some payments uh, to uh, these organizations, the HMOs, and uh, uh, so as to keep the scheme running. But again, you would recall that for many people who had reason to go to hospital, the advisory in the thick of COVID-19 is not to even approach a hospital unless you are gravely ill. Again, the PTF had to raise alarm that hospitals were not attending to non-COVID patients for fear, just as you mentioned, they didn't have, but some others were just not administering to people and of course people themselves were skeptical about going to hospitals for their health challenges not to be declared as COVID patients. That itself has done some level of damage to the entire uh, health system. How would the NHIS for instance key into 
removing these obstacles? Yeah, thank you very much. This is a tough one, but then uh, it, it can be simplified. Uh, how can it be simplified? It can be simplified by information, education, and communication, and also supply of this uh, PPE. No matter how much you, you, you want a health worker probably to be available to receive patient, you need to give some, some level of protection to him. And there has been a lot of innovation by, by healthcare facilities where they develop what they call a triage. They ensure that in the healthcare facility, whoever is coming will be subjected to that triage and be assessed. A preliminary assessment. If there is a suspicion, and there should be a high suspicion index, if there is suspicion, you now begin to treat that person along the line of COVID. This requires a lot of information, education, and even training of the healthcare workers. And people that are sick will continue to get to, to, to seek for services. Otherwise, will be confronting COVID and people will be dying of non-communicable diseases. Right. So we need to educate people, we need to continue to, this is one of the risk communication strategy that has to be out, in, out there to ensure that people are educated. You cannot sit down with hypertension or diabetes or any other disease like cancer or even simple uh, malaria that might gravitate into a severe malaria because of COVID. You have to seek for healthcare services. There's what is called health seeking behavior. And uh, we need to ensure that there is proper education of people on this health seeking behavior. And we also need to ensure those innovations at the level of healthcare facility to be able to guarantee and protect the healthcare workers while also rendering services. And I think we are learning a lot and people are doing a lot in, 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 in terms of this innovation. Now, just two quick issues before we round off here, and that has to be with the enrollee this time that wishes to change the uh, healthcare provider, the hospital. How easy is it to do that? Many enrollees have spoken about wanting to do that because they're dissatisfied with uh, what they're getting. Cyril, I told you the situation now is cumbersome because it's manual. Mm. With the new ICT that is coming under the National Health Insurance Scheme, you can change a role in your bedroom. You can change HMO. You can change provider in, your, in the comfort of your bedroom. What will happen? The new ICT system that we are trying to de deploy is that once you get into, once you log in, mm. it will open the page and uh, it will say select your provider. By just clicking, the providers will come on. If you aren't, want to select a provider in, Ab in Abuja, it will, uh, you go to the state, click, all the facilities mm. in that state will come on. Then you now click and it will go. And uh, that information will just automatically tr be transmitted to the okay. National Health Insurance Scheme. So by, uh, the magic wand is to ensure that we have this ICT to turn around the entire system of the National so Health Insurance Scheme. So reiterate for us when this will come on stream. Uh, it's, a, it's a difficult one, but uh, okay. based, on our, based on our projection, in the next six months, it will come. The reason why it is difficult for us, it is a, a project that has to go to Bureau for Public okay. Enterprises, and it has to go to Federal Executive Council. But uh, we, have, we are reaching out to all the stakeholders to ensure easy uh, attention of that. Well, Professor Sambo, it's just, um, well, July 2019 you took office. So it might be premature to ask what you can count as your achievement so far. What we might ask is, um, are you confident that what you set out with the three-pronged uh, agenda which you came with, you are well in line towards achieving them? Uh, uh, if I'm not confident, I will just stop. <laughs> but because I'm confident, I'm pushing. Uh, if you look at 
stability. I think the most important th okay. thing that 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 uh, that that pleases my mind in the national right. insurance scheme, we don't see people. We don't see security coming to throw tear gas in national health insurance scheme right. now. Okay. And uh, uh, the, the, the staff of national health insurance are getting to be well behaved now. Okay. Everybody, that synergy is being fostered. All and right. secondly, the health insurance under our roof okay. is a new innovation that we have developed. No country has ever All muted right. that idea. And once we have that health insurance under our roof concept kicked off, all the things we have mentioned here will be automatically be put into perspectives. Okay, we'll have to leave this conversation at this point and hope that we ask you to come again and uh, take a second look at the NHIS. But for now, Professor Mohammed Nasser Sambu, Executive Secretary, National Health Insurance Scheme, has been interested in talking to you on one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Siri. All right. Thank, thank you. you. And that's our program today. We thank you for watching. Next week, we'll be back with One on One. I am Cyril Stover, and I say stay safe.